The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and Podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Schroeders is a global asset and wealth manager with broad expertise across public and private markets, investing on behalf of individuals, institutions and advisors. We support advisors to help their clients build successful portfolios to achieve their goals, whatever they may be. We are proud to be partnering with Ensemble to host a dedicated investment space on the Ensemble platform to have more meaningful conversations with their clients and to give advisors a more efficient way to engage with Schroeders. Join the Schroeders investment space on the Ensemble platform today. Hello, welcome back to another episode. Uh, today, I've got the pleasure of speaking with Nick Donnelly from uh, Plenary Wealth. Nick, thank you for joining me. Hey, James, how are you going? Good, good. Thank you. Thanks for appreciate you actually reaching out. I, I put the uh, post on LinkedIn to say I was starting to do this podcast, and if anyone was up for a chat, uh, let me know. And, and you were one of the first ones to reach out, so thank you. That makes my job a whole lot easier if I've got someone volunteering to, to have a chat. So thank you for for joining me. Not a worries, uh, here. Maybe if we just start with a bit of a chat about plenary wealth to begin with, kind of yep. who you are, where you are, yep. types of clients you deal with, and we'll and we'll see where we go from there. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So plenary wealth is ten this year, so we've been around since two thousand and thirteen. Yeah. Um, there's three advisors, uh, so myself and the two guys that started the business. Uh, yep. We have three support staff as well, so that's spread across. Um, power planning, operations, and we've got some offshore support as well. That's something we've introduced in the last few years, which is working really well. Uh, we're based in Sydney CBD um, in Spring Street. We've we've been, our licensee is Walker Lane, um, which has been for, for four years. Uh, and Walker yep. Lane was actually started by three firms. We have six firms within the licensee now, and three of those firms sold started the losses. So we've grown to six. Uh, which has been great in the last few years, and you know we're always on the lookout for for other advisors that uh, that are keen to join the group. Yeah, right. I'm going to organise a, a chat with someone else about the the, the licence change. But what what was that? Just an interesting point that you make that change of licence four years ago was that a was that a big undertaking to go from wherever you were to kind of your your own licence of sorts? Or was that a yeah. big undertaking? Uh, I think definitely. You know. You know. My role that that was, I had been with the business for two years at that time, so I started as an associate. So I, I wasn't heavily involved in the actual transition, but you know the, there was a lot of work involved, you know, in transitioning across from one license to another. Um, and, and I think often talking to to the the guys that were involved and, and made the decision, it was actually making the decision that it was a big part of it. Um, getting together with, yeah. with, with like-minded advisors and, and, and having a crack at changing and doing it so Yeah, good gotcha. Yep. So so you've been there for six years then? Six years? Uh, yeah, so I started um, yeah started as, a, as an associate in uh, mid-2017. Yep, yep. And, and what were you doing before that? Were you in and around the financial advice space? Um, always been in financial services. So um, my, I, I studied accounting at, at university when I finished high school. And I've largely worked thereafter in in the sort of fund accounting, fund administration space, both here and and I was a bit of time overseas as well. Um, and it was about 2016 when I sort of made the jump uh, across to advice. Um, I had a, a short stint at BT in their scaled advice team, um, so that was sort of telephone based advice. It was mostly around sort of superannuation and insurance. It was, it was very scaled. Um, and then, you know, the opportunity presented itself at Plenary Wealth in 2017. Um, so one of the founders of Josh, you know, I've known him personally sort of all of my life. And when the opportunity came up, um, yeah, I moved across and started as an associate um, and, and then became authorised in around about 2018 or so um, and been an advisor yep. there ever since. What, was, was, there a, was there a trigger for the, the, the change in being on the more of the... The, the funds aside to the to the financial advice side was it some trigger that made you 
jump the fence? Um, look, I have been thinking about it for a long time, and I, I find with a lot of a lot of things in life, it's not till you sort of start getting a little bit older and you start becoming a little more, I don't know, just just aware of what what works for you, what doesn't work, what you do like, what you don't like. Um, you know, and and I feel like for most people, you know, they finish high school, they jump straight to university, they're 18, 19 years old. Nobody really knows exactly what they want to do for the rest of their life at that age. You know, you, yeah. you make a balanced decision and, and you, you try it and you see how it goes. And I think, you know, over time, moving, I suppose, out of the back office space of some of that fund administration and fund accounting into something more client-facing was going to be something that worked in my favor because I think it suits my personality a lot. And there are a lot of people that when I was talking about making the jump, just bouncing ideas off people, you know, a lot of people were sort of nodding their head and saying, yes, I, I think that's something that, that you'll be really good at. And oh, fantastic. So it's sort of, and look, I mean, fund accounting, fund administration, you know, accounting in general, you know, you're generally looking back, you know, you get towards the end of financial year and you're looking back over the last sort of, you know, 10 to 12 months, what's taken place. Whereas, as you know, financial planning is very much about, you know, when a client comes and meets you, it's largely day one and it's about planning for every day thereafter. That's a far more exciting prospect for, for me personally to sort of, someone comes across and, and you know that, you know, you're going to be able to help these people for the next 5, 10, 20 years plus. Yeah, and I think, I don't know if it's just a financial advice thing. I, I speak to a lot of people in financial advice circles, but more and more and more, I think it seems to be really common that people in some way, shape or form have just kind of fell into financial advice. They tend to love it. The people that fall into it and stick around, they tend to tend to love it. But there's lots of stories of you know, very few people, maybe it's a little bit more relevant now with the the degrees that are pointing you in the right direction for yeah. for, for SEER and all the other requirements that are necessary now. But in years gone by, you did an accounting degree, you did a commerce degree, you did whatever. And then somewhere along the line after you're 18, now you're 21, you're 25, you're 30, lots of people seem to just fall, in, fall into financial advice somehow. S you're in a similar kind of path to that too. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I would totally agree. It's sort of opportunity presents itself and, and people have to think about it and, and they jump and yeah and I find largely that it's one of those industries where you've got a real concentration of people that are, that are very passionate about it um, yeah. and you don't get that in every other industry yeah, true now now pl now plenary wealth so can, can you talk us through the types of clients that you that you work with there who, who, who are your clients um, so we're different things to different people and probably an easy way to describe our clients is the type of advice we provide and its level of complexity. Uh, so I have clients with relatively simple needs, of which most advisors in the country can help. Uh, typical advice, optimizing their super, some personal insurance, might need some help controlling their cash flow or budgeting, uh, medium to long-term financial projections, and potentially assisting with property transactions, so home or investment property. Uh, clients with more, I guess, intermediate levels of complexity, uh, so basic SMSF structures, so fund viability, establishing the SMSF, uh, implementation of the investment program and ongoing SMSF management, uh, basic stamp estate planning, so simple wills, etc., uh, and more complex insurance, so key man, buy, sell, or insurance for the self-employed. Uh, and then on a more complex or involved side, um, SMSF advice around limited recourse borrowing arrangements and execution, uh, structure changes, complex investment programs, and broad ongoing SMSF management. Uh, we work with a lot of trusts, so family trusts, special disability trusts. Again, just understand the viability, establishing the trust, implementation of complex investment structures and ongoing trust management. Uh, we're doing quite a bit of work with deceased estate management, so helping trustees carry out their duties in difficult scenarios, so they may have beneficiaries with drug or alcohol dependence, victims of abuse, those with severe disability. So again, viability of the trust, establishing the trust, uh, implementation of the investment program and ongoing management just to make sure that they continue to meet trust the obligation uh, and complex estate planning so you know, building and testamentary trusts to wills power of attorney and guardianships I guess the type of individuals so PAYG employees business owners we have overseas or dual citizens or clients in the US UK Singapore Thailand Japan we're getting more and more tech employees as well your Amazon Google LinkedIn uh, and specifically around uh, the employee share schemes. But my specialty in the business is elder law. So that 
sorry, elder advice. So it really encompasses aged care, home care, retirement villages, granny flat arrangements, and everything settling. And look, they're a great client because we often talk about the scale of clients who want advice and clients who need advice. They definitely fall into the spectrum of needy advice. And the broad issues that, that are helpful with the aged care costs, funding options, social security implications, and estate planning consideration. So those older clients, the you know, if they're, if they're seventy five plus, like how, how are they coming to you in the first place? Are, are they the mum or dad of the forty five year old that you that you're working with, or or are they just finding you through some other means? How, how does the seventy five year old end up sitting in front of you in your office? Well, it, it, I think it comes down largely to how they're referred to you. So look, look in most cases, um, you know your referrals for aged care for those types of people. Um, a lot of the time, interestingly, it actually comes from other financial advisors. So, and the reason is that you know a lot of advisors don't really seem to 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 like working on on aged care. They, I'm not exactly sure why, but in some ways, I suppose I do understand. You know, it is specialised, it's complex, it's very involved. Um, so, a lot of advisors, as as you're probably aware, don't don't sort of um, aren't able or, or aren't willing to help clients with with aged care. So. To give you an example, there's ten advisors at Walker Lane, of which I'm the only one that specialises in aged care. Yeah, right. So you know, I might get the, an email or a call from another advisor, and this might be a long-standing client. Um, they might be a couple, and one of them needs to move into aged care, and they're looking for their options there, and that's where that referral will come from. So that's the example of how they'll come across to me. And so that, like that, that type of client where they're they're a long-standing client of some other advisor. You're you're being brought in to do, you're kind of just doing a, a, a like a one-off job of sorts, however you might describe it. But you're doing a one-off job for this client that's a long-standing client of some other advisor. You're wheeled in to deal with the aged care piece. Yep. And then the relationship stays with that that previous advisor. Would that be right? Yeah. In in that case, that's correct. Um, yeah. You know, the the relationship outside of that piece of advice continues on the same trajectory, but. You know, we, we do, I, I suppose what I always say to clients is no matter who it's referred to, you know, no decisions are made in isolation. So if it's a referral from another advisor, their current situation and what they're doing and how they're working with that client also becomes a big part of that. At the end of the process from my side, typically the relationship just continues with that, with, with the existing advisor. But look, they're... I really like those types of referrals because, you know, well, for several reasons, you know, the, the handover is really warm. Um, the client is used to the advice process and sure. to the client that sees value in advice because otherwise they wouldn't have an existing advisor, um, nor would they be comfortable to be referred to another advisor. Gotcha. So you, you were talking before we started recording about it's not just aged care and, and there, there's a few different elements of this kind of elder advice, aged care type, type advice that you're, that you're providing. Maybe we can tackle each of those and, and, and talk through what you're doing in in the space, maybe what your process yeah. looks like. So if we maybe we just start with the aged care yeah. piece. So 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 that's someone needing to go into an aged care home. You, mm-hmm. You're talking about where where that introduction might come from, but take it from there. You know, you've yeah. someone sitting in front of you. What are you doing? What's your process? How how's that coming together? Yeah, and I think just well, that the, the first term aged care. It, it's you know that, that's. You know, normally that's the term that most people use, aged care advice. But, you know, as I said before, you know, I think of it far more as as elder advice because there are several more elements and several more areas of advice that we help clients with. Um, but, you know, tackling the, the permanent aged care. So we might get a referral from, from another advisor or from another referral source and really common situations. Um, you might have a husband and a wife and one of the partners is requiring permanent aged care. Um, so you sit down and, and, and quite often, the interesting part about this is that people don't always know that we actually exist. Um, I've had other clients uh, or other friends that have said to me, look, I wish I knew someone like you exist because I've been through this process. It's really, really tough. Yeah. And, and people don't know that this is a specialized area. So yeah, we, we typically sit down with you know a short introduction phone call just to get an idea of the type of help that they're looking for, making sure I'm the right person that can help them. Um, and then we'll have a more extensive sort of scope session where we really sit down. You, you're not solving problems. You, you, you're really trying to understand because, you know, understanding and empathy is a huge part of, of this type of advice because people are going through a really, really big change. 
So it'd be a case of sitting down, you know, understanding where they are at in the aging process as well. You could have someone that is is already in aged care in what's called respite, which is called sort of like a, you know, a temporary um, visit to an aged care facility, um, where it might be someone that that is expecting to need aged care, but it's kind of like a a try before you buy sort of scenario. So you might have someone that's already in there and they're trying to understand, you know, what it's going to cost. You know, the implications for, for their assets. Um, I'm going to lose my pension, keep the pension, but I have to sell my house. So that, that that's a pretty common scenario. Someone comes, they're in care all ready to move into. And then it's a case of just understand where, where they are, what they want, um, and, and get a handle on just the ways that you're going to be able to help them. And in terms of in terms of the advice that you that you deliver to them, is is it a is it a scoped in this case where it's residential aged care, is it a scoped piece of advice dealing with residential aged care? Are, are you using anything like the aged care steps calculators, advice generators? Like how how, how are you actually generating that advice, delivering that advice? What, it, yeah. what tools are you using? Yeah, most definitely. Um, so <laughs> once someone comes to you and they they are ready to move to aged care, it's very much about one of the first questions people always have is, you know, how much is it going to cost and what's the best way to pay for it? So, you know, there, there's a vast amount of information out there that can help, particularly with a lot of the, the product providers. A lot of the product providers soft, soft, provide fantastic software and calculators that can give you an idea of exactly what things are going to look like. Um, how much is it going to cost each and every year? Um, what will my pension change by? So the impact on the cash flow. And the strategy comes from that. Um, if we do option A, this is what it's going to cost because every decision that they make, particularly financially, is largely going to have an impact on their Centrelink entitlements, which is, when I say Centrelink entitlements, I'm talking about their age pension, but I'm also then talking about the actual fees and charges that the aged care facility is going to charge, which is guided by Centrelink. So, yes, it's using sure. the software available for you really to project out and place a picture in front of the client to say this is exactly what it's going to look like if we choose this part. Yep. And so, and so once you've you've delivered that advice, you've come up with the you know the optimal way that you believe to mm-hmm. restructure their assets or pay pay for things. Yeah. What what's your involvement then off 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 the back of that? If the selling houses or whatever, how, how hands on are you with with the back end of that advice piece? Yeah. Look, well, very very much involved all the way through the entire process. And one of the things about aged care advice is it, it, it's highly emotive. You know, when, when people when people come to you, you know, they haven't just woken up in the morning and thought, you know, I think I might get some aged care advice. This is something that's been probably rattling around in their heads for, for several months or several years. And when someone comes across and they sit down and, and, you know, you say to them, look, you'll go through this once or twice in your life. I'm doing this every day of the week. You see, you know, the shoulders relax, the tension largely disappears because they feel like I found someone. So I found someone that can help me with that strategy, but is going to, you know, essentially handhold me through that through that whole process. Um, if the client is selling a home, so I act as their representative through the full process. So that might mean communicating with a real estate agent, the conveyancer, and any other professionals that are involved in the process from listing the property uh, all the way through to sell them. Um, and then I'll also interact with both the aged care facility and also with Centrelink. So the aged care facility, just managing the communication so the client's not stuck in the middle. So I might be saying, client A, we'll be moving into your facility. We're going to pay, pay pay a rad of X amount and the daily payment for the remainder. We're expecting the asset to sell in three months. The money will be transferred to you. And you know my role is just to keep the client informed you know i will need their help along their way with transfers and, and signing forms and so forth but really uh, my role is to to execute everything and communicate between i guess everyone um and then that does extend to centrelink as well so we'll become what's called a centrelink nominee for our clients um, which essentially means we can communicate with centrelink so we can ask questions we can provide updates and you know, Centrelink is, you know, is, is can sometimes be a big battle, particularly if a lot of clients have already had exposure to it, which they normally have because they're partway through the process. You know, they, they have a little bit of fear about it, which, which I understand. So it's just a case of not only updating Centrelink, but the big part with Centrelink is making sure that they do what they are saying they're going to do. 
you can't take anything for granted with Centrelink. Um, it's it's our job as advisors to make sure that they understand what we're communicating to them and that they put it in place. And that's just something you learn over time. So that's our role during the process and really our, our I guess, our role ends once we're comfortable. Asset restructures have been am- amended if they need to, property buyers and sells, the fees um, that the client are being charged are correct. Um, the Centrelink entitlements have been amended correctly. Um, uh, estate planning also comes into it as well and the interaction between paying a RAD to, a, to an aged care facility and what that looks like when the resident eventually passes away. And look, it really, our role really ends at that point when we've implemented all steps in, in the advice. Gotcha. So, so, that, so that's the residential uh, aged care part, but, but are there areas of elder advice that you're that you're providing maybe maybe the first step before that with the home home care packages what what does that look like as we've you know at first financial we, we do a little bit of aged care advice as well but in terms of being I don't know, I'm, I'm really keen to pick your brain on it in terms of feeling like we're being valuable in the residential sorry sorry in the home care package space mm. i think we're still the jury's out on that yeah how how are you dealing with that what, what are you doing in the in the Home care packages. Yeah, home care probably, you know, it represents a relatively small portion of the advice we provide. What we often find is a client okay. might already be receiving home care when they come to us because they might have a view saying, you know, mum or dad or spouse may be moving into permanent care. At the moment, we're getting home care under package, you know, at one, two, three, or four. So it, if, however, if a client comes to us and they come to us with the intention saying, look, I, I would like to get some home care, what am I entitled to and can you help me obtain it? You know, the answer is yes. So, again, it comes back to, I suppose home care would be slight, is slightly less involved in the sense that it generally doesn't require as big a decisions around your asset restructuring. You know, the big decision buying, selling the home yep. won't normally come into it. Um, it's more about, you know, everyone is aware of the, the massive wait times for, for, for home care by essentially. So, it's about Again, becoming the Centrelink nominee, making sure that we're communicating with Centrelink, they've got inf- all the information that they need so we don't get to the front of the queue and they say this box hasn't been ticked and we've got to start again. Um, once we get to that point where we've been you know, granted home care under a particular package, um, we also have other partners that we refer to, um, home care providers, because the client typically has to choose that themselves. Um, so we've got a sort of trusted network there of people that can help. Again, just making sure they get the care that they're going to be paying for because it is a space that is a little bit grey, I would potentially describe it. You know, like any profession, there's some home care providers that are a lot better than others. True. Yeah. So that, that's typically our, our role with home care. Yep. And, and are there areas of, of elder advice? You, you mentioned yep. before we started recording there was granny flats. I haven't done any advice uh, around and- granny flats. Like I, I know... Kind of, you know, roughly what they're talking about, but the ins and outs of it, I've got, I've got no idea. Hey, what What are you doing in that space? Yeah, it's 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 look, it's a very very interesting space, and I think it's an area that will continue to become more and more popular. You know, with you know the cost of you know property just increasing exponentially, you know, particularly along the the eastern seaboard. So the term granny flat can be confusing. As people immediately think the elder must live in a small structure in the backyard, which is not the case. So the easier way to describe it is multi-generational living. So it may be a separate structure like a granny flat, but it can often be within a home um, with dedicated spaces, you know, for living, bedroom, bathroom, etc. Uh, for the elder, just to ensure that, importantly, they keep their independence. So essentially, I, I, I guess to go back a step, so a granny flat arrangement or it used to be called sort of life interests. So essentially, you have two parties. In most cases, it would be an elder with an adult son or daughter. So it, it, it's a, think of it as an exchange. So the elder will provide financial support to the son or daughter typically. Now, that could be in the form of cash. It could be in the form of a property um, or a combination of both. So it works in the sense that the elder person, think of it, often it could be thought of as an early inheritance and it's a great tool for that. Um, so they might buy a property for, for son or daughter. Fantastic. Um, in exchange for that, uh, the son or daughter agrees to provide um, care for that elder for the rest of their lives. So 
there's two parties to it. Now, what's really important to remember with granny flat arrangements is your client is typically is always the elder um, because they're the most vulnerable and they're the ones they're the one that has the most to lose. So never forget who your client is is a big part of granny flat arrangements. It's something that I've learned. Um, so you have a scenario where mum and dad move in with son or daughter. Um, and they agree to take care of them for the rest of their life. Now, this is um, a legally binding agreement. So it is we consult with a lawyer to, to draft these agreements um, after meeting with, with our clients and understanding that they're all very comfortable to move forward because there is a financial side of it, but there's also the non-financial side. It's, it's one thing to say, yes, I'm happy to receive these assets. I'm more than happy to take care of mum for the rest of her life. But the dynamics of relationships can change over time. Um, and moving in with um, an elder parent is a is a far different proposition in reality um, versus theory. And I think often people can be clouded by the reality of now getting themselves on the property ladder, and then when the reality hits of looking after mum or dad for the rest of their lives, you know the last thing that we ever want is a relationship to be strained because of that. Our role as advisors, you know, in, in almost every advice is to, you know, hope for the best but also plan for the worst. We need to help people picture what this is going to look like um, because when things go south, um, you know, memories can be short. <laughs> uh, but it typically, with this type of range of beyond just the exchange of assets and so forth, there's there's a change in Centrelink entitlement, entitlements as well because, there's, yeah, typically if you're earning the full pension, you can't just give away all your, sorry, if you're earning no pension or part pension, you can't typically just give all your assets away to receive the full pension. Yep. Um, the, the gifting provision. So, granny flat arrangements allow kind of an exemption for those assets that they're giving away that the client typically largely, if it's done correctly, uh, won't, be, won't be negatively impacted from a social security point of view. Is it is there some type of limit to how much you can give away, or a calculation that happens? Like what? Yep. What, what's that look like? There's a, there's a formula, a, a relatively complex formula that 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 is based on age. So okay. as you as you get older, the number changes. Gotcha. Um, so it sort of it, it is scaled, and it depends on the client's age, but it also depends on the type of asset that is being transferred as well. So once you've made that decision, once you've got an understanding of what they're looking for, or what they're actually picturing the the outcome to be, that's when you start working with Centrelink and say, okay, well, if if you give away X amount, that amount won't count towards your your asset test for your full age pension. Um, so gotcha. again, it's just another example of not looking at anything in isolation. If uh, there's no point in someone giving away all of their assets if they're just going to lose the pension and have no cash flow to live on. So it's sort of you've got competing. Not competing interests, but you you need to, need to think think of both both sides of the equation, but also just be conscious that the elder is the one away that's largely giving away the bulk of their assets. So they are the one that's more vulnerable. They're the one with more to lose, and 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 they are the client. It's important never to forget that. Yeah, Have you, <laughs> you talk about relationships and the and the reality of living with mum or dad may be different to what it sounds like before it happens. Uh, any horror stories of uh, of of things going south, or it's it's been Many. smooth sailing mostly. But to, to give you some background, um, up until two years ago, granting flat arrangements existed, but no legal contract was required. Centrally okay. accepted, um, a granny flat arrangement was in place, but the elder did the elder had had virtually zero protection because son or daughter takes the money. Um, they move in together. Son or daughter gets a new partner, new a new partner doesn't like mum or dad. Uh, mum or dad's given away all of their assets to the kid, and then mum and dad's out on the street. They've lost all of their assets, and that Jeez. might sound extreme, but that is one hundred percent what typically happened. And it's 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 just one example of what we call elder abuse. That's a really tragic outcome, and it wasn't that uncommon as as hard as that is to believe. Now, what changed two years ago was. Legal contracts were required. A legally binding agreement was required, and it was part of the changes to to CGT legislation. Because if there, there could have been CGT uh, implications for the person um, giving away their property, because he's technically mm-hmm. selling the property. So to ensure that people were exempt from CGT, the 
legally binding agreement was is is now required, which which is great from a CGT exemption point of view. But more importantly, you you won't have those situations where mum or dad could be out on their ear with with absolutely nothing. Gotcha. So it's um it's it's a complex area, but it, I, I I truly see that multi generational living. I see that being a big part of the future because you know people growing up now the challenges of of buying a house for someone that is twenty years old as opposed to you know. When, when I was a lot younger, it is incredibly difficult, and it this is a, is a fantastic way for that to happen. Um, but it's just got to be you just got to tread tread with caution. Yeah, really, a really interesting space to to be involved in. Actually, now that you explained it, thank you. Yeah, thank you. A, a, any any other major areas of elder advice that that you're doing? Is there anything else there? We do we do retirement villages as well. Oh yeah, retirement village. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so look, that's. Probably retirement villages and, and the, I guess the commonality between permanent aged care and retirement villages is that there's there's a big, you know, require, there's a capital requirement to go into a retirement village. Um, and generally, there might be a decision that needs to be made around asset restructure. Uh, the family home is typically how people fund um, their entry into a retirement village. Yep. So again, it's, it's a case of I've got some clients at the moment. You know, they've had a couple of health issues over the last sort of 12 months. Um, definitely no need for, for permanent aged care, but a retirement village is definitely going to give them far more security. You know, people people don't move into retirement villages uh, to make money. It's quite the opposite. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you go into a retirement village, they're run by typically large operators, and when you leave, um, you typically pay what's called a departure fee, furbishment fee, whatever you, you want to call it. Um, and that's a big part of it because moving into a retirement village is, is fantastic for people. That there's amenities, there's like-minded people, um, there's care close by. Often they are quite close to an aged care facility or they're connected to it in the event that a resident might need permanent care in the future. So it's, it's the perfect outcome for a lot of people. But you typically, you might be selling your home um, and you you know, ultimately often transfer that exact amount to the retirement village and you broadly don't share in the capital gains of that retirement village. So you're moving it from an asset that ideally would be typically growing in value um, and you're moving it across to, to an asset that you don't share in the capital gains plus when you leave, you generally pay a departure fee too that can be up to 35%. Yeah, it's huge. But, you know, we say to clients, look, it's You've got to think about the non-financial things. That's going to give you the security, um, knowing that help is close by, you know, ground floor, you know, lots of accessibility and, and lots of like-minded people around you. Um, you know, that's a great outcome. Uh, sometimes the kids aren't as happy because it can, <laughs> it does affect the ultimate estate. Um, and, and that's a big question we ask clients. You know, we say so many elders, so many elders, one of the real common themes I, I find with, with um, elder advice is, they're more uh, the clients are more worried about their kids than themselves. Oh, I don't want to go. I don't want to pick a too nicer aged care facility because I don't want my fees to be too high because it will leave less for the children. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it, when the clients get to that stage? There's a the younger retired age. It's more about we're spending money, having a good time, traveling, and then as they get to that you know, 75, 80, it seems it's a bit of a mortality thing. Worried about how much are they leaving behind making a decision around how much they might leave behind. Yeah, look, that, that, that's, that's exactly right. They they become concerned about that and, you know, again, it comes back to, you know, never forgetting who your client is. You know, we want their mind to be expanded to say, look, well, I'm certainly not discounting that in any way, shape or form, but you do need to think about yourself as well um, and, and sort of striking that balance. And typically you land somewhere in the middle. So, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a very yep. common, common theme, I suppose. So we've got so we've got residential aged care. There's the home care packages, granny flat arrangements, retirement villages. Anything else? Is there a fifth one? No, that's that, that's that's pretty just much four? it. Um, and I'd say probably you know two thirds of that would probably be permanent aged care. But I'm sort of a bigger piece of the pie is definitely granny flat arrangements um, and retirement villages. So I think that's going to be the case. Yeah. So they're going into the future. And look, we touched before on on that sort of one off piece of advice. Um, for our clients, and, and and it typically does. But you know, in in some cases, you know, clients 
do if they do if a client comes from say um, an accountant or, or a lawyer or from an aged care facility themselves, they may not have an advisor in place. And yep. once once that sort of implementation is complete, um, you know they they I've often often had clients that do stay on as, as ongoing clients. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, no, well, thanks uh, for joining me, Nick. Where, where can people find you if if anyone if there's any advisors listening that. As you said, there's not that many that are doing aged care or elder advice mm-hmm. and they need your help. Where can they find you? Where can they reach out to well, you? Probably LinkedIn is probably the easiest way, but um, but all my details are also available on the, the Plenary Wealth website as well. Perfect. And we'll put some links and things in the, in the show notes for anyone that's watching or sorry, listening along. There'll be some comments in wherever, you, wherever, you're, wherever you're listening to this, you might be able to click through. So thanks again, Nick. Appreciate you joining me and uh, th- thanks for being here. No, it was great. Great to meet you. Thanks so much. This material does not contain and should not be relied on for financial, accounting, legal or tax advice. Schroeder's does not give any warranty as to the accuracy, reliability or completeness of information presented. Visit www.schroeders.com.au forward slash advisors for more information about our funds.